all of you, and I know we are quite many listening in today, um, to this event about the, one of the real great things in health policy and policy development in, in Europe, the state of health. We will hear how this program works in the introduction that's coming up very soon. Uh, but the most recent steps in the process are the country reports that we're going to talk about today from all of the EU member states and the companion report summarizing uh, and putting on recommendations on the, on, the, on the individual country reports. I have followed the uh, gradual development of health system comparisons across Europe for quite a number of years. And I also noted that it was not always so welcome in all uh, member states. But where we are today with the cooperation between the Commission, the OECD and the observatory is to me perfect. And I really believe that comparing data and trends in health systems is a very good way to identify best practices and uh, to give input to changes in reforms in health systems based on what actually works out there in the real world. And I think this is the positive way of using this uh, process, the data, the analysis available. Um, some people are afraid of being, uh, it should be used for naming and shaming and so on. But let's look at it on the positive way. It gives good indications of what actually works, what are good uh, practices and something to be emulated. There are people, of course, who claims that we cannot learn from others because we are too different in Europe. And my advice to them is open your eyes because we might be different, but we're not that different. And I think some of the differences are actually also factors that can explain uh, why we have different performances across the systems and also therefore indicating ways to go forward. And I think that everybody in Europe has something to gain here because I don't think there is a perfect health system in Europe, but I do think that if we pick the best from around Europe, we might be able to create some really super good systems that can develop, uh, develop uh, high quality care for the patients. But I'm really, really grateful for the excellent speakers that we have today. Uh, we have, uh, of course, speakers from the three organizations that has cooperated with us uh, um, uh, to create this event, the three organizations behind the state of health. We have Maya Matthews from the DD Santé, the European Commission. We have Francesca Colombo from the OECD, and we have Josef Figueras uh, from the European Observatory. And I don't think it gets any better. So we are grateful for your time. And then in addition, we also have two panels with stakeholders that we will introduce as we go along. And finally, we have a concluding session where we're also trying to look into what might be the next steps in European health policy and coming out of the European Commission as well. But we have a lot of um, things to do this afternoon. We only have one and a half hours, so I think we should uh, get started. And I think we should start with the presentation of the State of the Health Programme. We have two speakers. Josef will go first, and then he will hand over to Francesca. Josef, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you to the EPC. Thank you for the call to the colleagues at the Commission at the OECD for working so closely together with these country health profiles. A real pleasure to be here today. What we wanted to do today is to present the third cycle of these country health profiles uh, together uh, with Francesca Colombo, my colleague at the OECD. The idea, as much as both Francesca and I would love to speak uh, three or four hours each to present the depth of that work and the same the colleagues at the Commission because there's a lot of work. There are profiles for the 27 EU countries uh, plus, um, plus, plus Norway and Iceland. We have to reduce ourselves to 10 minutes each and we thought the best was perhaps to focus on two areas, on two areas that these country health profiles have covered, which is the digital health and the health workforce. Undoubtedly, if you look at the research, there have been two key areas that explain the resilience of, health, of some health systems of, uh, to, the, to the COVID pandemic. And two key areas if we're looking at uh, building a back better. This slide, next slide please, shows the, the cycle of the state of health in the EU. It's a two-year process. It starts with health at a glance uh, in Europe that compares different countries. Then it's the country health profiles, which we're presenting today. Uh, which is, as I said, profiles for the 27 member states plus two. The companion report, which we are drawing a lot today, uh, done by the Commission, that which actually highlights 
some of the key areas, two of them that we're going to be talking about today, digital health and health workforce, and that Maya Matthews uh, then will be uh, summarizing, and then the voluntary exchanges. And let me highlight the voluntary exchanges, because that's an opportunity in which we use this evidence to work with member states as a platform to debate policy options and to compare with each other. So this exercise is not just a research, an academic exercise, but it's the opportunity to learn, as Hans said beautifully at the beginning, from each other, an opportunity to find areas of collaboration, an opportunity for the Commission to support these member states with many of its tools it has uh, to support reforms, as well as, as I said, the voluntary changes, an opportunity for the country to look at themselves, look at the options, look at the state that they are and what are the possible ways forward. Next, please. The structure hasn't changed much, it's the same one, but this year we focused, of course, of course, on, on COVID-19. So the structure there is fairly systematic. I think it's a real miracle. I'm still so pleased and happy with our colleagues, uh, uh, Francesca, about their ability that they have had to summarize these systems, these country health profiles in so few pages. They are very sharp, very, uh, very focused. And as you can see, the structure on the left highlights summary of the summary, health status. For each one of these areas, we identify a number of key indicators that change uh, in some instances in some years, went from one cycle to a cycle to the next, and that give you a good sense of where the country is. Without benchmarking, Hans, as you said, it's not about naming and shaming, but it does compare countries, and it shows the uh, possibilities for improvement, the possibilities particularly for learning from each other. The health systems, uh, an organization financing, resource, uh, uh, resources and service provision, and then we use three dimensions of, of the impact around effectiveness, accessibility, and resilience. And I'm very proud to say, and thank the Commission for that, we started uh, already in the first cycle of the country health profiles measuring resilience well before resilience has become such a sexy and uh, discussed topic. Uh, the data sources come from uh, the, the Eurostat, the OECD, come from the CDC, WHO, the country, uh, the heads of the observatory, the IHME and many other sources of that kind. Next, please. So two slides to give you a bit of a background. It's more of a reminder. There are plenty of background, background evidence there that you'll find in the country profiles that tell you a bit the situation of each country. These two slides, we had to choose between two of those, two of these figures, remind us of the different background in which the countries went into the pandemic. This one is well-known one. I don't need to spend much time. It shows on the upper side of the graph the cases uh, per million, the number of cases per million. We see clearly the Omicron pandemic there, uh, the Omicron variant, rather, that doesn't correspond to the increase in mortality. Uh, two, uh, I won't spend time on that. We could spend hours on that. And I actually encourage you to look at these figures for each one of the countries. But I using, I'm using this figure as a two reminder, a reminder that the background was very different, a reminder that the pandemic is still around. We, we're not going to discuss now whether the, the pandemic will become an endemic, but we do know that there could be no variants, that the numbers are still high. And as important, as important, a reminder of the enormous backlogs, the enormous backlogs we have there that we need to address, and a topic that perhaps we can address later. The second, next please. The second figure that I wanted to share with you, again, of the many we have in these policy briefs, uh, sorry, in these in this country health profiles, and I want to encourage, it's a bit of an appetizer for you to look at those, is this one that shows the enormous differences in the level of expenditure between our member states. If you look at the uh, PPPs per, euros, PPPs per capita, we're talking as much as a third. So the lower country, Bulgaria, there's a third of the higher country in Norway in the amounts of euros per capita. In terms of GDP, it's around a 50% difference between the lower and the higher. That's extremely important vis-a-vis -vis of the two topics I'm going to be talking about now, which is the topics uh, of, of digital and then uh, Francesca on the topic of the health workforce. So there are constraints, there are differences there that we need to take into account while we're looking at the reforms. Next, please. So as I said, as I announced several times, my part of the presentation is about uh, the digital innovation in healthcare delivery and public health. Again, 
this painful process to actually constrain ourselves to one aspect of digital innovation, which is telemedicine. So the next data I'm going to present, which is reflected in the country uh, health profiles and in the companion report, uh, is, 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 is brother, is looking at digital innovation, uh, not only in terms of telemedicine, but also in terms of screening, in terms of contact tracing, quarantine, planning and supply. So, we all know, we know that digital innovation has been a bit the, the silver lining, if you want, of this pandemic. The question, the question we're all facing now is how sustainable these changes are going to be. How do we uh, continue with that and how do we harness this innovation and how we steer this innovation? So the data I'm going to present now is to get you thinking why that happened, why we got so much uptake in this case of telemedicine, what were the key factors that we want to harness for the future, for the sustainability? And what are the elements about the quality and effectiveness of this digital innovation? Next, please. In the next one, again, doesn't require much, uh, much of a, a presentation, really. Uh, it shows, this comes directly from the companion report that I've been mentioning, and shows the percentage of, of the population that uh, uh, used a teleconsultations in the first 12 months of the pandemic, comparing a period in 2020, June, July, and February, March, 2021. So the bars would be 2020, and the dots would be uh, February, March, uh, 2021. As you would expect, the percentages increased, huge difference between member states. So a reminder there that some countries will need more support and will greatly benefit of the Resilience Fund, which goes very much into investment on digital health and digital technologies. Huge difference between member states, but clearly we see that there's been an increase in the use of these tools. So the next two slides that I'm using now, next please, are about trying to understand what happened there, what can we learn, again, to harness that, to steer that. So on the left, we have Portugal. Portugal. Uh, shows the, uh, the, 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 the number of um, uh, consultations of telemedicine uh, plus the number of face-to-face. Of, uh, -face. So the, the, the orange one would be face-to-face, -face, while the brown one would be uh, uh, digital uh, telemedicine. So you see a reverse in that pattern that goes from uh, 2 million to 1 million, 2 million uh, per month that it would be uh, um, teleconsultation and one million that would be face-to-face. Uh, -face. So why that happened? That happened because the technology was there, but more importantly, technology had been there. You can see that there were some level of teleconsultations. What made the difference? Made the difference that it was made much easier for the uptake, including changing regulations, including the, the, the payment systems, including not only for physicians, but for psychotherapists as well. On the right, you have the case of Finland. I should step up a bit because I think I'm running out of time. You have the, step, you have the, the case of Finland, which shows the same kinds of uh, figures. Uh, uh, and, and you'll see the orange bits would be teleconsultations while the other would be face to face. There again, there's been a fundamental increase at the end of 2021, as you can see, or mid end of 2021. And again, we saw a number of incentives that were put in place in, in, in Finland, but also an important learning. An important learning is that teleconsultation did not work always for certain vulnerable groups, such as the aging population, and also for some people with addictions and so on, where we saw an increase on those addictions. Next, please. And finally, the, another example, which again, tells us lots of lessons around how we harness, how to sustain digital innovation. So this is France. France shows two peaks here, uh, coinciding with, uh, with the lockdowns, again, on the number of teleconsultations. Uh, and it tells us several lessons. One, that when the lockdown goes down, seems to be that uh, population and perhaps the practitioners prefer to see the patients face to face. So we need to look at why there was this, this, the, this decrease there, number one. But importantly also, what was put in place in France 
to ensure that uh, these uh, teleconsultations were adopted. Again, what we saw is the changes in regulation. We saw the consultations made available to nurses. We saw uh, that uh, physicians were encouraged to change these types of consultations. So all in all, to summarize all that, there are two sets of lessons. One, we need two lessons that Maya will mention later as well, we'll continue highlighting. One is we need to evaluate well the impact of, of digital. We need to see when it's effective, in which cases it's effective. We need to do look at value for money. We need to issues of quality. And second is not just the technology, is all the mechanisms, the regulatory mechanisms, the financial mechanisms, the quality mechanisms, but also the cultural mechanisms in changing the views of the population and changing the views of the providers. Next, uh, I pass the, the, the baton to my colleague, uh, Francesca, with apologies because I think I took too much time. Over yep. to you. Thank you so much, Joseph, uh, for, for the baton. And again, thanks for the excellent cooperation uh, with the commission, uh, my young colleagues, uh, yourself at the observatory for this very strong and very effective I think collaboration. Let me move on to a, a different uh, topic where we want to really show some of the evidence from the country profiles and the companion report, which it's in the area of uh, rethinking of health workforce strategies. And it's a particularly important topic given what we have seen and continue to live in the context of the pandemic, because quite clearly the health workforce is the backbone of any health system. And quite clearly the pandemic has just manifestly and very evidently shown how uh, the health workforce and our health system are not really uh, resilient uh, enough and how a much more binding constraints than having physical uh, capacities and facilities or having um, even you know beds in hospitals on, or ventilator is really having enough health workers so ultimately talking about the health workforce is talking about and thinking about the type of investments in health system resilience for the future. So let me begin some of the issues, starting with, if you can go to the next slide, starting with a similar uh, figure to what uh, Joseph presented for health uh, uh, expenditure. And that really shows the very tremendous uh, degree of variations in the health workforce capacities at the beginning of the pandemic. And these graphs is really drawn from a country health profiles, it, it shows uh, you know, countries which have a high and low level in terms both of doctors as well as nurses. And you can see how a, a group of countries, you know, more uh, Western countries and the Nordic countries high, are quite well endowed in terms of uh, both doctors and nurses. And on the other hand, countries more in Central and European countries having much less and quite clearly it, countries which have less human resources will be more exposed and vulnerable to pressure uh, that will come in the context of the pandemic. Now, if we can move to the next slide, continuing on, on uh, this same uh, topic, these slides uh, show the density and shortage of healthcare workers and how it varies not only across countries, but also within countries as well. And there is quite tremendous variations really in the availability of doctors and other health professionals across different regions within a given country. And these uh, particular graphs are taken from the companion uh, reports. Now, there is a lot of talks about medical deserts. So this uh, term was actually, uh, it's not a new uh, term. It's, uh, it has been around and was introduced about 15 years ago. And it talked in particular about the deserts or the lack of professionals with the uh, reference to GPs, but it's quite clearly that we are talking not just about GPs, but also about the, the need to step up the numbers of health professionals uh, from uh, other, other categories of health professionals. But it's uh, quite important to uh, note that those deserts and uh, lack of availability of professionals are not just linked to more rural or remote areas, but they're also uh, more uh, urban, uh, na disadvantaged neighborhood um, in, a, in, a, in different cities and so forth, where uh, the issue of availability of health professionals is particularly important. And would we, besides the issues of what happens, uh, uh, you know, within countries and between uh, different uh, regions, there is also the question of how 
have we over time been able to cope with uh, such medical deserts? And if we look on the right, it's just one example from France that shows two different points in time, 2012 and then 2021. And you can see how the uh, density of health professionals has been actually decreasing in, uh, in different uh, um, parts of, uh, of, uh, of France, considering, for example, some of the more uh, central parts, also some of the southern or even the area around uh, the, the, the capital. And in, a, in a, uh, average uh, uh, terms, uh, the, the availability of GPs uh, per thousand population decreased uh, over this time period from 1.5. GPs per 1,000 population to 1.4 GPs. So there's been a, a trend towards having uh, less availability. Now, countries are aware of these issues and the number of policy actions that have been taken or are being considered, which by and large can be looked at uh, in different ways uh, and different buckets of policies. On the one hand, trying to really making GPs, or it could be applied also to other categories of health professionals more attractive, uh, increasing also the, the number really of training uh, capacities that exist, but making really the profession more attractive. And secondly, trying really to influence the decisions about where to locate, where um, uh, medical doctors or other category of uh, professionals decides to, to go. And this can be done through different type of incentives. They can be more carrots or sticks. Quite clearly, carrots have a tendency to be more effective uh, uh, and than the use of, uh, of uh, sticks. Now, if we can move on to the next uh, slides. Uh, in the context of the pandemic, many countries have mobilized uh, to really put in place policies that try to increase the number of health uh, uh, professionals. And uh, as I mentioned before, really the, the uh, category, the health professionals are the backbone of the health system. And they, many workers have worked time for less and so over time and putting themselves at great risk for their um, uh, mental as well as physical health uh, uh, as well. So it's really the um, I point to the medical professional as being the biggest constraints in addressing crisis and in building resilience uh, of health system. Now, the good news is that there's been a lot uh, of uh, uh, response uh, and innovative uh, and flexible practices that have been put into place in many countries, trying really to uh, address and put in place strategies to scale up the numbers, but also to improve the deployments of health workers in order to meet new demands. And so if we could categorize them in some way, a possibility of looking at them is really to consider strategies that try to modify work practices, working, for example, on uh, uh, reducing or changing the times when people can take leave of absence or even adding obviously extra hours. Uh, these things obviously add more pressure on the workforce, but certainly we have seen a lot of actions uh, in this place, or even changing the rules for re-registration of health professionals. There is a different set of policies which has been trying much more to mobilize people that might have left the health profession or who are inactive, thinking about recruiting uh, you know, different uh, um, individuals or people that were retired or even uh, mobilizing more medical and nursing uh, students or people who are in the uh, military, military uh, medics, for example. And the third category of policies relate more to thinking about reskilling of redeploying, repurposing of uh, uh, the health professionals, for example, across different spe specialties or trying to move uh, uh, people also across geographical uh, regions. So bringing in private sectors, uh, uh, workers into the public sector and so forth. Now, if we can move on to the next slide, which is my last substantial uh, slides, uh, perhaps a few words uh, on one possible uh, policy uh, as well, because in the context of a uh, uh, workforce shortage, much discussion and debate has been sparked around uh, the idea of having some minimum uh, staffing requirements that could be put in place to improve both the working condition, having more workers that are available at the minimum uh, in any facilities and in any uh, given country on location, but also to improve uh, possible uh, problems with uh, patient uh, safety. And it's fair to say that those debates pre-existed also the pandemic, if we look countries like uh, uh, like Germany, 
there were some minimum requirements for the number of nurses in different hospitals, for example, or similar requirements uh, were existing also in countries like uh, Lithuania. During the pandemic, some countries such as uh, Germany tried to deal a little bit with uh, changing some of the rules around minimum staffing requirements in hospital uh, units that were not dealing, for example, with COVID-19 patients in order to reallocate staff uh, to uh, taking care of uh, COVID patients in other areas. But following the pandemic, there is definitely a renewed interest um, and discussion about the possible merits and the possible drawbacks of setting minimum staffing uh, uh, requirements and uh, why there are the general supports the idea there are also some questions that will be important questions to address uh, for the future about for example whether the requirements should uh, where they when they're put in place should cover just hospital uh, units or also refer to primary care or even long-term care facilities about whether there should be even requirements at the uh, EU level or country specific uh, ones, how to deal with the minimal staffing uh, requiring and take into account also differences in geographical distributions or even how minimal requirements uh, um, for uh, doctors and nurses and supports should take into consideration the skill mix. So this is just an illustration, not that I have all the answer to that, but there are certain debates about uh, um, this policy as an, one possible policy to address the workforce shortages for the future. Now, if we can move to the last slide. Some key findings, uh, uh, you know, clearly COVID-19 has highlighted that health system were not resilient enough to shocks and that is sparking lots of debates, analytical work, thinking about new different uh, solutions and uh, clearly building a more secure and resilient health system for the future will require smarter investments. Um, we pointed to areas where those investments would be particularly important, uh, the digital transformation of health system and the health workforce. Now, in terms of the digital health solutions, they have been really tremendously helpful in ensuring very quick adaptation and implementation of uh, uh, you know supports uh, you know making sure that services could be provided and maintained for all those people who were affected directly by COVID, but also others that were indirectly affected, and maintain the continuity uh, of care. They do raise questions, uh, nevertheless, for the future. How do we ensure, for example, that those services are available to, to all, regardless uh, of their age, regardless of their level of income or vulnerability? How do we raise the, the literacy of individuals to make sure that all can benefit from those digital solutions? And clearly, an, uh, an evaluation and assessments uh, of the deployment of digital solutions will need to be kept in place on a regular basis. And secondly, on the health workforce, which, uh, as I mentioned, is a, a fundamental pillar of a resilient health system. And the pandemic has shown the need for further uh, investments to address shortage in primary care in particular, but also clearly in other areas. And uh, there have been lots uh, of uh, innovations, uh, lots of uh, uh, attention to improve also re uh, retention rates. And it's quite clear that moving into the future, there would be a need to rethink about so what's the mix of policies that can uh, uh, maintain improved patient safety and retention rates, uh, act not just on the numbers, health professions most on the overall working conditions and with that thank you uh, uh, so much again uh, and uh, you know looking forward to the discussion thank you very much thank you to joseph thank you to francesca it was really great stuff and i also think uh, some clear uh, conclusions my question is will we actually begin the reforms in time because i have seen surprisingly little activity between the different sort of waves we've had during the pandemic. Uh, but I think um, the louder we shout uh, about the necessity to prepare better for whatever might come afterwards, the better it will go. So we definitely have it here. And I also think I have forgot to say to those of you that don't know that you can actually download the report for free. Um, I don't want to give the websites here because you can just uh, you just search for it in your search. Um, machine, just uh, search for, for uh, 
the publications and they will come up and that includes also health at a glance that uh, we had uh, last year and that we'll again uh, get again next year with a lot of data in it search for it you will find it i know at least you can download it for free from the commission i don't know if you can from the oecd and from the observatory but uh, francesca is nodding so i think you can just go for it and then read it and that's an order now it's worthwhile uh, there's a lot more to it, of course, than uh, the digital and the workforce. These were just the two subjects that we uh, we uh, uh, decided to discuss now, and we will um, uh, continue on those two, two tracks and try to look at the advantages of digital innovation in the healthcare delivery, but also seen from stakeholders and from other than the authors. And I think, as Joseph was saying, the uh, the issue has uh, on on creating uh, real resilient health systems with the help of digital innovation has been uh, growing during the pandemic uh, and i think it will also uh, be top of the list for reforms in the coming years also post pandemic if we dare say post the pandemic i really hope we can we can think about it but it's not only i think about contacts and consultations but it also about various aspects of treatment and definitely analysis as well and i also think that it is important that we don't do digital transformations for the sake of digital because I have in my long life been seeing um, cases where digital solutions has actually had um, not the exact wanted effect, but has been taking a lot of time for maybe not too well trained health professionals, but eating up their times uh, instead of giving time free, setting time free to make the systems more resilient and to give the health professionals more time to deal with what they should be dealing with, namely the creating value for the patients. So uh, there's quite a lot of things to, to deal with here. And now we have a discussion between panelists. We have Elizabeth Adams, who is president of the European Federation of Nurse Association, so a health professional. So I'll come back to the question of well how well prepared you are. Ray Pinto uh, works on digital transformation in digital Europe nowadays. And Professor Anna Udon is the president of digital health in the European Public Health Associations. And we have asked you on beforehand just to mention or to highlight one aspect from the report that is very important in your opinion and then we can try to see uh, we can go a little bit along with the discussion so i ask you to be a bit brief here but mention uh, one aspect that you think is of extreme importance yeah, elizabeth can i ask you first you can indeed. And firstly, as a non-author and not being involved, can I just commend the authors at the European Commission, the OECD and the European Observatory on an absolutely fantastic report. I think Joseph lined it up when he said it was a miracle. I don't know how you have managed to consolidate all that data and make it such an easy read. And I can recommend it to anybody. The order from hands was to read it. And I would absolutely say read it. It is, really is an re easy read but it's really packed with information and well, well worth it. So thank you for that. And as Francesca already said, you know, many of our members were at the front line in uh, relation to, uh, you know, uh, facing COVID-19 and are still there. And then the ongoing impact uh, on health services and waiting lists that we have to face uh, in relation to uh, going forward. But uh, from our perspective and from healthcare professionals perspective, I have to say that we are really passionate and committed to embracing, engaging with digital solutions. The issue often is that the environments aren't quite prepared or they don't have the, the, the right number. They don't have access to the right equipment to do it. And, that, and that's why you see in the report that telemedicine was one of the easier ones to do because people could access it, they could get on, they could move and they could make the solution. And I think that what we have to do is, um, and absolutely as Hansen, we have seen many digital solutions that actually cost time we will embrace it once we get better outcomes from patients. It's patient safety and it, it gives us more time to actually deliver the care that we actually need to do uh, uh, to patients uh, going forward. And um, so I will say that, you know, certainly the pandemic did show that there was a rapid implementation of some novel uh, digital uh, solutions. But with that, we have a huge process to look and to examine it. I think it's really important in relation to ensuring that 
people at the front line, there's co-design in relation to solutions going forward because they can really inform what will work and what won't work in relation to it. So investing in particularly education as well as Han said was particularly lacking in, in some with some groups of uh, professionals and uh, that has to be invested. Regulatory frameworks uh, did certainly help when the scopes of practice were allowed to open, where limitations were taken off. As, and when health professionals don't have to fight for that themselves, they can focus in on delivering the care. So providing the resources of, you know, developing the regulatory frameworks, uh, you know, the investment in education, removing all kind of the administrative processes, uh, people can move. And one just example, just to hit me, Regardless of what is going on in a, in a healthcare environment and delivering, for example, when at the early stages of COVID there was no PPE and health professionals still got in there and they still have to deliver, whether they have to wear, you know, plastic bags in order to protect themselves or whatever they have to do. So regardless, so if you give the tools to the health professionals at the front line, they understand it, they are part of the process, they will certainly embrace it and engage. And I won't delay hands, I'll hand back to you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. But this, um, actually you are saying that if constructed the right way, we help digital solutions can help to create more resilient health systems, but probably uh, that the, the ones pro providing the solutions should deal very much with the health professionals and the patients as well when they design the schemes, I suppose, is, is also what you're trying to say. So, uh, Ray Pinto, you are coming from the industry and you are in the industry organization, the digital industry organization. Are you willing to do that? Or are you just imposing digital for the say, of, of digital solutions? No, I don't think we can oppose uh, uh, digital solutions. I fully agree with Elizabeth, right? Don't ask me to design a healthcare information digital system. Ask the nurses, they're on the front lines. They know what's needed, right? Don't, don't give them something uh, that uh, they don't use. And I think that uh, I'm hoping, Elizabeth, you can tell me that there has been a sizable shift in designing these health systems. Uh, I hope it's going the right way where the frontline workers are being asked. Uh, when I look at this report, and I, I fully concur, uh, excellent report, uh, what struck me the most is that um, there still is a massive fragmentation of where you can be treated. You can live longer depending where you live, right? And that's not the EU I want to live in, you know, uh, just because I'm blessed to be French. Uh, and have uh, great health care and as well living here in Belgium, uh, that should be accessible for everyone in the EU. Um, and you know what I've noticed in the report is that um, a lot of the report is about technology and digital you can see, right? It is uh, track and tracing apps. It is uh, uh, COVID passports. It's online communication tools like what we're using right now to speak. It's chatbots in, in Hans's country of Denmark, chatbots were very successful. Um, but there is also, when you think about health systems, uh, the digital that you cannot see. And this is where you really see the fragmentation in the EU. So, you know, when you want to use AI for research, when you want to move data from member state to member state to find a vaccine, uh, when you want to combat cancer, um, that is just pretty much impossible things to do in the EU at the moment and something that I really hope and look forward to seeing a robust uh, European health data space addressing. And, um, and I, think, I think that we, we can't ignore the, the unseen digital and the role it plays. Um, and hopefully we can look back at the COVID period and see what worked, what didn't. And, and I think COVID has, has kind of blessed us, though it's horrific by giving us uh, the ability to test these digital technologies at a massive scale. So hopefully now we can move forward. And what I'm very afraid of, to be honest, I'm not seeing uh, this at all. And if you're a member state, please fight it. But let's not just think, hey, it worked for COVID. Let's stop that now. We don't need any consultations anymore. It was expensive. Let's you know, go back to face-to-face. So, you know, uh, let's see where the digital plays a role and reinforce it and keep moving forward. We've, we've, we've left almost a generation 
in this debate on how to use digital and then we should keep it that way. Back to you, Hans. Thank you very much, Ray. And we need to go on because digitalization is, is necessary if we want to create resilient health systems. And we need to do that. We need to be more robust in, in the way that we spend the money, not only because of the pandemic, but because of the, the demography, because of the pressures that are on the health system these days. And I think you made it very important. You made many important points, but the one about the European data space, because uh, you were talking about my home country of Denmark. Yeah, but I'm in Spain now. This is another of my home countries. You know, and I need to be able to uh, to transfer the data. And uh, I think besides that, um, yeah, you know, I'm in Brussels as well quite a lot. You know, so so I'm a European, and I need a European data space also for for health data. But and I think it's not just for treatment, uh, but also for analysis. And um, I think we can be a lot wiser if we if we get a space like that. So let's try to to push for that as well. Um, I would like to, to uh, turn now to, uh, to Anna and, uh, and ask you, uh, as president for digital health in the European Public Health Association, what your reactions are. And maybe, I don't know if you want to address it, otherwise I'd like you to do that at the end. But is there, is there a risk that maybe digitalization can create more inequality? Uh, because we've all been talking about everybody should have the same access. And Ray, as you said, we want to live in a Europe where everybody can get the same treatment. But will did, can digital solutions maybe exclude some people? Anna. Yes, thank you very much, Hans. It's a great pleasure being here and representing the European Public Health Association, which brings together or more than 25,000 public health experts across Europe. And it is exactly the European dimensions that clearly emerges from, 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 from the report. I mean, it's evident to say that uh, the pandemic has boosted the process of public health digitalizations on, on two channels. First, because it has helped controlling the pandemic, thinking about contact tracing, the delivery of mass immunization services on one hand. And on the other hand, as Joseph showed briefly in, in, his, uh, in his presentation, it helped maintaining accessibility for healthcare services. So we had this booster effect that we do agree with Ray, we haven't to lose beyond pandemic times at certain conditions, because if digitalization was a potential prior to the pandemic, and now it emerges that it helped, we need to take that value and go beyond uh, the pandemic, leaving, as WHO says, no one behind, taking care of equity, items and dimensions and taking care of what we can do to enable the process of digitalizations. Um, at UFA, we have tried to conceptualize how the process of public health digitalization should be beyond pandemic time, because it's too easy to say that uh, digital tools support uh, the transition from cure to prevention, which is one of our objective. Digitalization helps people and patients being at the center, supporting their empowerment through different ways. And digitalization makes healthcare management and delivery potentially more efficient, safer, and cheaper. First, this has to be improved and quantified. And I'm glad that Joseph was mentioning about assessing the impacts of uh, using digital health solutions. So this is theoretical. But then what pillars are needed for a successful European strategy for public health digitalizations? So briefly, seven points. We need political commitment, and we do have that, at least at the European level. We need a normative uh, regulatory framework that technically enables digitalization cross borders, as you were mentioning, Hans. Uh, and then we need the technical infrastructure. And we saw uh, it clearly emerges from the reports that the technical infrastructure supporting digitalization varies widely across different member states. Yeah. We need economic investments, and hopefully we will have them in the, in the next future. We need training and education of both target populations, healthcare professionals, and other professions involved in uh, health systems and health services delivery. 
We need research and then we need monitoring and evaluation to tackle and track uh, this process to effectively happen with no, potentially no inequalities in access to digitalization within and between countries in a European perspective, which is the perspective that we all embrace. Thank you very much. Um, uh, you mentioned also prevention and, and diagnostics, and I think that's in a very important area for digitalization as well. Not only the quick and precise, or more precise uh, diagnosis, but also, I suppose, with the help of artificial intelligence to, to, to prescribe optimal pathways for patients and so on. So, I mean, that, that is definitely one good use of, of, uh, of technology and digitalization. And besides that, when you introduce digital solutions, you often also have to go over your organizational structure and the way that you do things, and that gives another chance to give to make reforms. But I think the conclusion of this uh, short uh, discussion here has been that digitalization should be created not by digital specialists, but in cooperation with the health professionals and the patients. I think we need to train or dedicate training to the health professionals of all kinds to get the, um, the maximum out of it and not be afraid of the techno uh, technological solutions. I think we need to design it in such a way that it does not create inequality, but is uh, open for all and can improve all patients' lives in, in, in Europe. And then I really think that we need a European dimension to this uh, to be able to make certain that it can cover persons who are traveling around like idiots like me, you know, being in different places. But I always try to be where the sun shines and it does in Spain at the moment. So thank you very much for that um, uh, contribution here. I think we will come back to some of the aspects in the, uh, in the conclusions that we're coming to. I'm sorry that I couldn't give you more time, but this is the way we, we the time we have today so, and you used it in a splendid way. I'd like to hand over now to Emma Woodford, my uh, colleague from the COO of, uh, of the European Policy Center because she will take care of the next uh, um, work, uh, the next part of panel discussions we have, which is about the workforce strategies. Over to you, Emma. Thank you very much, Hans, and thank you everybody for that fascinating panel. I think it's quite a natural uh, progression now that we delve a bit deeper into thinking about workforce strategies and planning after the COVID pandemic and how to create more resilient workforces in uh, Europe's health, health systems. And I, you know, I use the word resilience with care here. When, I, when the pandemic hit, I was working with Oncology Nursing Society. And if anybody was resilient, it was the nurses. And Elizabeth, you're right, you know, you'd get a nurse and there's a certain spirit, there's a sense of duty and a sense of commitment. And you give a nurse a plastic bag, quite literally, she'll put it on her feet or he will put it on his feet and go out there and save that patient. And if that's not resilience, then, then I don't know what is. So I think we need to be quite careful when we're saying health workforce resilience and remember that individuals as human beings were actually far more for resilient than, than, uh, than perceived. Having said that, the mental health burden on the workforce has been enormous. You know, the report talks about 49,000 healthcare workers across Europe who died of COVID in the pandemic. Um, this people's colleagues, people who they work next to day by day, it becomes a very personal story. In Spain, we saw 57% uh, of the health workforce displaying post-traumatic stress uh, disorder symptoms. And likewise in Austria, 64% of healthcare workers having similar symptoms. So in this panel, I'd like to go around my, uh, my wonderful guests here. First, we have Sarah Dadas from the committee uh, of Standing Committee of European Doctors and George Valiotis from the European Health Management Association and Paul Bomker, who's a board member from Mental Health Europe. Welcome everybody. Like Hans, I would like to, to start you off with um, a key question. What did you find most important in this report? What struck you the most? And as we probably won't have time to then do a second round of questions, I'd like you to also add you know, what would be your key recommendation for solving this particular issue that struck you the most? Sarada, would you like to go first? 
Yes, good afternoon from my side. Thank you very much for, for giving us an opportunity to share our thoughts. And also, uh, yeah, thank you very much for the interesting presentation so far. And of course, the reports. Um, we see that the, the companion report and also the country health profiles um, really echo a lot of the feedback that we have been receiving from the CPME membership, from the National Medical Associations, whom uh, we surveyed during the first waves of the pandemic in 2020 and 2021. So um, a lot has already been said, which I don't want to repeat in, in too much detail, but indeed this kind of situation of having to deal with shortages already before the pandemic, and then having to try and build uh, on top of that a, a surge capacity by bringing in people uh, from, from um, different uh, places, and this was already elaborated by uh, Francesca very well, um, was uh, something our members reported on very much. Um, yeah, we also saw that the workforce had to pay very high costs. So. Um, of course, there are now really unprecedented levels of burnout. Uh, there are very shocking uh, reports uh, about violence against doctors. And actually several of our members have reported that they have some form of police protection at the moment, um, especially in relation to anti-vax movements. Um, and also, as you mentioned, um, very sadly, there was a tremendous loss of life among the health uh, professions. And uh, at the, on the 20th of February of last year, uh, CPM actually took the opportunity of the anniversary of the diagnosis of the first case of COVID in Codogno to collaborate with the Italian medical chambers and to um, have a day of commemoration for all health professionals who lost their lives during this pandemic. So looking ahead now, uh, well, um, we see that it's uh, continuing to be difficult to deal with the pandemic on the one hand, the vaccination rollout, trying to maintain normal services as far as possible, but also dealing with the backlog. And our members have reported that with the current health workforce situation, of course, this some countries is estimated to take several years until this backlog of treatments is um, tackled. And um, basically, uh, looking ahead, all of these reports, they realize that is to conclude that um, despite the many differences in healthcare systems, um, that there is a very obvious under-resourcing in many cases, and that we really see uh, that there, well, we describe it as a shift from, there needs to be a shift from just in time planning for our health work, for health systems in general, including health workforce systems, uh, to a just-in-case approach. And um, this is where maybe to come to our recommendations, which, which our members have been developing in the last months. Um, we really think it is, um, there is a need for really effective health workforce planning and to really uh, look also not outside of the concept sort of of pandemic, which is now being tackled in uh, European Health Union legislation to also more long-term changes. And um, here, uh, we find very interesting also that the OECD, uh, as mentioned, does very much agree that there should be a move towards the European Commission providing benchmarks to member states for minimum resources. So this includes uh, in the broader scope of, of pandemic preparedness, um, also issues such as PPE, um, facilities in terms of ICU facilities, for example, but we also think that it is uh, useful to have minimum capacities for safe, safe staffing levels and also then consequently safe patient care because that is ultimately the objective. And uh, we know that there are many differences between member states' health systems, but we hope that launching this discussion and agreeing on some sort of um, guidance will really help ministries also identify and, and also implement um, opportunities for investment, especially now where there is, let's say, a revival of the European semester mechanism. There's the recovery and resilience facility and a lot of uh, funding available. So um, we really hope that the European Commission can follow up on this idea in some form. We also hope that there is an opportunity to create a more permanent European level monitoring service on health workforce to assist member states in creating and maintaining planning structures and improving them. We know there are a lot of activities. There will be another joint action um, and uh, hope that this will be also a more permanent uh, platform then for action. Um, and uh, we also very much support EU support to training. So especially in context of pandemics, but also beyond 
uh, to use opportunities for cross-border training, for multidisciplinary training, to take into account the One Health approach, and uh, really to, to find an approach which tackles uh, barriers to training, which are often cost and also lack of time when it comes to CPD. So here we see a role for the EU level. Member state level, as mentioned, we really see the need for health workforce planning policies. Uh, we we uh, do believe that these are necessary uh, to ensure also universal health coverage, as we've seen, but also uh, to enable surge capacity. And uh, we believe that it is important that member states build training capacities, that they do not lower training standards to plug shortages, uh, but that they really work towards long-term sustainability and resilience, and also take into account changing expectations of work-life balance in uh, the workforce going forward. So this is just a very short summary of some of the thoughts that the membership has uh, reported to us in the context of the pandemic, but also looking forward on health workforce. And uh, yeah, I hope that uh, we'll have Thank more you. to discuss this. Thank you, Sarada. And I, I sort of, I always feel when we start talking about health workforce and EU uh, interventions and possibly funding training, we're sort of, encroaching the elephant in the room also which is uh competences and the treaties you know are we are we heading for looking for treaty change here so but that's a big question to throw out <laughs> at this stage of the day uh george over to you thanks emma thank you so much for having me today and uh to, to all my peers on this panel there, there's a lot to say and uh and from what's been said already everything resonates we really welcome these reports by uh, the observatory the oecd and the commission it all resonates so now we really need to be taking some particular action the, the first thing though that i think is essential and uh, i think emma you did it very well is to acknowledge the, the very good work done by healthcare workers and health managers across europe They've done that at, at immense sacrifice, immense personal sacrifice. It's not just their mental health, it's their physical health. And these are things for me that need to be our number one priorities. We can't serve the needs of patients effectively if the workforce isn't safe and looked after. So, so the continued work in addressing that for me is, is what's really essential. Um, I think some of you have spoken well to that and it's a short segment. So, um, so other things that I wanna bring attention to is what resonated in the report really for, for my organization was the point around the renewed focus on more sophisticated workforce planning. Because by doing that, actually you can help all of those things to be improved. It, it can play a significant role. Um, so the, the points I'm gonna make now, a lot of them are drawn from our members and from people who contribute to our conference, which is a, a peer reviewed abstract driven conference. So I just wanna acknowledge the people who've been really building on this work um, just like I acknowledge these very good reports that, are, that have been published to say, okay, we, it, we're really on the same track. Everybody effectively seems to be agreeing the, the big points. And now it's about some of the practice points. What we're observing is that while EU countries face similar challenges with their health workforce, things like shortages, maldistribution, digitalization, also EU countries will have different contexts. And that includes their different strategies and plans um, when it comes to health workforce planning. So what we believe is needed is for an organized and collaborative strategy on the future skills and the future skill needs of the health workforce. And this should be done across Europe so we can really um, standardize it, but also tailor it to, to countries. We need um, to assess the current planning strategies that countries have, identify their needs and define their objectives. And then we can set up implementation plans on how to collectively achieve these objectives that we've very well identified. And now let's take this action. So like to do that, then what you need to include is improving forecasting. Um, like Sarada, I think you've, you've spoke to that really well um, and planning capacities. We want to ensure sustainable and resilient health workforce um, across really all of Europe. And really, I, I suppose in summary, we need more enriched collaboration between member states to improve health workforce planning capacities. We, we need to share lessons learned. We need to learn from challenges faced from each other and experiences. Now, if I've just got another moment, the other thing I'd like to really speak to is um, when we talk about training needs and, and what that can help us do is we can't do that without addressing the, the well-being needs of the existing workforce. And it's very difficult to go to the workforce and say, let's train you more when already they're struggling. What people have been presenting at the Emma conference is the need for um, support therefore on resilience. And that could be technical skills on, on resilience. 
Um, and we also know that there's there's management um, practices that you can use, things like value based healthcare uh, and lean management. And then by by in, instead of looking for more workers, because we know there's going to be a challenge on the workforce. Yeah, we can grow it to a to a degree, but we really need to make the best use of the workforce that we have. We need to grow it in the way that we can ethically with the right ethical recruitment of migrant workers. So that needs to be done really carefully. But by using lean management styles and value-based healthcare, that could also really support capacity to be redistributed, to take pressure off high pressure zones and, and redistribute it. I think in summary, those are my points. But Emma, I would say, I mean, there's a lot to say. You can see mm. from the speed at which I'm speaking to you, there's a lot more to say, but I, I believe my peers have really spoken to that quite well. Thank you very much, George. Yes, it's an enormous topic. And um, yeah, well, we can create another event to take more. That's fine. <laughs> uh, and last on my list, I would like to welcome Paul from Mental Health Europe. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would like to underline every word you said before. It's right. And, and this report is so important for our daily work because in, 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 in my native language, we call it I always look on my belly button and see only my belly button, you know, and <laughs> we have to change this because I think that a lot of national uh, national systems try to to improve the national system and not and not looking what's going on uh, in Europe, for example, and we can learn a lot about other systems, for example, the Bismarck system in Germany can learn a lot about the more the Irish system, for example, or the Spanish or the Italian system, and maybe vice versa. So, so this is one thing which is which, which I would like to underline about this companion. But coming back to um, the um, conclusions of, our, of Mental Health Europe, Mental Health Europe is an umbrella organization for a lot of community mental health services around in Europe. And what we realized um, in the last two years is that we have to refocus uh, our work on further education and training and integrate them better into the daily work process, for example. So we, we realized, uh, a lot of our members realized that further education and training, it's not something you can do over the weekend or at home somewhere uh, in front of the telly. Yeah, It has to be part of your daily life and daily professional life, first of all. And the second is that we realized that um, we need for the next step of uh, uh, the after the pandemic, we have to realize that we have to reorganize our management approaches for mental health or health services, for example. For example, for example, we have to change the platforms where we did where we deliver our services. So as MHE, we believe that we have to refocus, not to focus too much on the institution, but more focus on the community and focus on the peers in the community who maybe can help others uh, during uh, the pandemic or during any, any health issue. And last but not least, um, um, mental health or health of workers is a, it's a management a leadership task. You know, it's, it's, those, this is very good what George said before. Managers have to have in mind that um, uh, well being and health, uh, mental and, and physical and psychological uh, health of, of the health workers is a management task. It's not something which is done somewhere else, it's a task of management and leaders of every day. Oh, thank you for that. That's all. Thank you, Paul. And uh, that's a very great point to to land on as well. It's uh, mental health is very much about the managers, but I think it would also be well to be included in education training from the very beginning. Yeah, yeah. you're right. You're absolutely right. So I just would like to focus a little bit more, you know, that the managers or the leaders have to have uh, the task to think about this. Mm. Yeah, and it's about our own profession to do this in the daily life. Yeah. Okay, well, you're a fantastic uh, set of panelists. And in order to leave Caroline with enough uh, time to make a full presentation, I'd like to introduce Caroline Costens, who's the director of EuroHealthNet, to give her comments on the overall report. Over to you, Caroline. Thanks a lot, uh, Emma. 
uh, and thanks a lot for the invite. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, well, your Hasnet very much welcomes uh, this report, uh, which is indeed uh, excellent. And I wanted to uh, flag up two findings which are very important to our partnership. Uh, the first one is from Germany. The report states that 70% of people with low education were at risk of developing severe COVID-19 compared to 41% of those with a high education. So this confirms the fact that the severity of COVID-19 is very much magnified by existing inequalities. And the people with a lower socioeconomic backgrounds have a higher risk of dying from COVID-19 and or getting long COVID. I think this is partly also due because of the non-communicable diseases that were already existing, like diabetes or cardiovascular diseases. And these diseases are much more prevalent in groups that are also facing disadvantage. So one sort of key lesson for me is that resilient health systems should respond to this interplay of factors, to the comorbidities and to the underlying socioeconomic factors uh, that cause ill health and disease. Uh, a second example that I wanted to highlight is from Belgium, and uh, the report stated that nearly 40% of young people aged 18 to 29 reported systems of depression. I think these figures are staggering. Before COVID, uh, mental health problems were already on the rise, but now we see even a further increase in loneliness and anxiety and in stress, and a lot of this suffering is uh, invisible. Uh, mental health services are under-resourced, uh, struggling with long waiting lists. And if any health system has the ambition to become resilient, uh, more investments need to go to mental health services as well. So smart investments would be in health systems that uh, integrate their services. So integrate like primary care, um, public health services, mental health, but also social services. And in terms of workforce, uh, uh, we need to think of what skills are required, but also on the continuum from health to social skills. And how can we diversify the, the support that we give to the people most in need? Then I think we can also learn some lessons of what is not in the report. Um, the report is on the state of health in the EU. And of course, I understand that the majority of the report is on COVID. Uh, but there are also other topics that are not visible enough. Uh, one example is the air pollution. I mean, air pollution kills 400,000 people prematurely in the EU every year. And I think these figures are in a way comparable to, to COVID. The second figure is that one out of eight children are obese. You know, and these levels are increasing and this is really worrying. Over 30% of the food that you eat are ultra processed food that are high in levels of salt, sugar, um, uh, fat, you know, they are addictive, no nutrients. Um, and our sedentary lifestyles also have increased uh, during the lockdown, during the home working. So we really need to see more investments in diets and physical activity, which are enormously important for resilient health systems. And particularly in the area of food, the EU really has great tools and, and legal instruments even to, that are at the moment not uh, sufficiently used. I think lifestyle medicine is an upcoming area in, in health systems, which is important, but it's also important to realize that not everyone has, of course, the luxury to make uh, the healthier choice uh, or to decide how they want to live. But people that are, let's say, more facing disadvantage are often locked in their day-to-day -day situations. They have less coping resources and less uh, capabilities to an ability to, to move out or, or to change. So who is now taking responsibility uh, to act on, on promoting and improving health? I think we can see, and also from the, the debate of today, that the, the health sector has quite little capacity actually to provide appropriate responses to these problems. But of course, many of these problem uh, solutions lie also in other sectors. So my, my other lesson for a truly resilient health system, I think, is that we need to take a more societal uh, uh, approach. Uh, and this is uh, uh, embedded in concepts of economy of well-being, 
uh, and we want to we need to make health and well-being uh, the responsibility of the highest uh, possible level at government which is the prime minister or in case of the U european commission this can be commissioner shinas or maybe the commission commissioner that is responsible for the the network of the future uh, of europe uh, and ministers um, so that well-being uh, is really, and well-being budgets are taking into account in, a, in across sectors and that we really have a coordinated approach because I think that that will benefit uh, the functioning of, uh, of health systems. And, uh, I mean, this is the first sort of, yeah, insights. <laughs> okay, Caroline, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, you know, at the uh, EPC and in the uh, health program that's called CHEST that we have there, we have over the last couple of years had um, uh, an event in the autumn called Health in All Policies, where we've been trying to look into, for example, the risk factors that you were mentioning. And uh, we were discussing this morning in the steering group that uh, maybe this would be a theme again for this year. So you mentioned climate change, but I think there's also the food, as you said, the exercise, the tobacco and all those kind of things that burdens the, the health systems and maybe can lead to unavoidable, to avoidable um, uh, deaths, as uh, we also can see from the, the various reports from the OECD and so on. So that might, Carolyn, be something that we'll be looking into uh, this year. So uh, we agree with you on that one. But can I also ask you, um, from the way that you represent different nations and regions and maybe even local communities in the EU, what is your experience and what is your belief in, in, the, in this learning process? Do you really think that there is a, an ability and a willingness to adopt some best practices, to learn from, from the reports that we're looking at here and, and other right, real life uh, experiences? Or are we always just thinking that we do things best at home? Um, yes, I, I do think there is certainly a, a willingness and keenness to see how we can do things better and how we can learn uh, from each other. Um, already, uh, when we look at, at health systems, I think we have to see, okay, how, what are well-functioning health systems? Is it health systems that, that cure uh, many diseases or is it health systems that can generate uh, more health? Uh, so, so these debates are ongoing in, in member states. And I think that member states need to maybe assign like a healthcare minister and a public health minister uh, in order to make sure there is sufficient balance in, in what solutions are possible. Um, and there are discussions about uh, about the need to uh, to monitor much better the impacts of health systems on health inequalities, uh, for example. And I think that the cancer registry, uh, inequalities registry of the Commission uh, that is actually also meeting today is a very good example of, of the data that we need to collect, uh, the disaggregated data on how we are doing or an uh, impact on vulnerable groups. Um, also, we need to make sure that we get on board the voices of uh, those that are not uh, normally uh, appearing in surveys, like um, uh, young people or people with uh, ethnic uh, backgrounds. Yeah. Uh, in a way, uh, we found it a pity that inequalities uh, was not an explicit objective of the, the EU for Health uh, programme. I think there are also discussions in, in member states, what we hear from our members on, mm. on new elements of, of, uh, uh, of health systems that can be looked into, for example, on uh, prescribing non-medical treatments like nutrition or combating loneliness or exercise. And there are very nice examples on social prescribing in, in Portugal and in Finland, uh, in Sweden that we need to look into. Also in the in the Netherlands, uh, you have health insurers that reimburse patients that take part in evidence-based interventions to, to achieve more healthy lifestyles, which are accredited by uh, RVM, which is the, our Dutch member, the National Institute of Public Health. So there are great uh, new examples ar around there, uh, and we really uh, feel there is an appetite of member states to, to learn from each other and see what can be done better. But Did you just, oh, nope. yeah. <laughs> I also think I see some movements now after the pandemic and I can sometimes see member states, even some that are very much relying on their own silo, beginning to look for solutions that could be obtained from elsewhere, but they just don't admit it. 
but at least if you do like with the pizza for education at some time, you know, look around and uh, you don't need always to acknowledge it. But uh, but uh, picking up the best practice is a good idea. So you gave us a little bit of optimism here that uh, things might be going in that direction. So thank you very much for that, Caroline. And um, and uh, I will move on now to uh, to Maya Matthews who is back on screen with us. Uh, Maya, um, the EU has got a, quite a big role because of the pandemic, quite a big budget, uh, quite a different position, I would say, in, in health issues in, in, in Europe. So uh, we might expect a, a lot coming from the Commission in, these, uh, in, in this coming year. But uh, what are your impressions of the discussion we've had today? Thanks, Hans. Uh, yeah, wow. What what a what an amazingly rich discussion. I wish I could have discussions like this every day. Um, I want to thank uh, you and uh, your colleagues at the EPC for for putting this together. Um, and it's just been fascinating to hear, uh, you know, all of all of the, the 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 views about the report. And I want to um, publicly thank uh, all my colleagues who worked on the companion report and thank all of you for your very kind words. Uh, it was a miracle, <laughs> Elizabeth. Uh, thank you for saying that. Um, when we started putting it together in September, we really didn't know how how we were going to to get something that would be interesting, concise, and really focused on some of the main issues that we were able to garner from the excellent uh, 29 uh, country profiles and um, working with the OECD, uh, with Francesca, Gaetan and uh, their colleagues and with uh, Joseph and Susie and Anna and many others from the observatory has really been a pleasure. I think that um, I think that this whole um, journey of the state of health in the EU um, cycle, um, as you said, uh, Hans, it has been a journey and it's been an incremental journey, but I can say now that the, these country health reports at least are really are considered like the gold standards. They are used for many, many different um, kind of policy areas within the commission. Uh, we, we use them for the semester work. We're using them also for the recovery and resilience facility work, for looking at the cohesion plan. So they are really being used, which is, which is great, which is what yeah. we wanted. But more than that, it's also very good to see that there's no point for them just to be used for the commission. Um, it, they need to be used further. And that's why um, days like this, where we can actually see and hear uh, what uh, what other people think about them is, is really useful. Um, I wanted to just pick up on a few points that I heard, and I, I was really, really excellent to, to get the feedback. Um, to Caroline, of course, we would have loved to have five chapters in the companion report, and uh, the whole area around um, lifestyle and comorbidity, and uh, the very important point that we tried to put in about the fact that you still have the health inequalities gradient uh, for for COVID. That you know, health the health inequalities gradient is there for every every issue that we look at and disease and and i think that what what we try to shine a light on really in the first part of the of the companion report uh, where we say that we need to understand better um, the effects of the pandemic um, not only the new things that are emerging like the the, the side effects from the pandemic the long-term effects or, or long covid um, the effects that it's had on on young people in the way they live work study um, these are kind of long-term effects as well but also the fact that it exacerbated and shone a light on existing um, issues for example uh, health inequalities but also workforce so if i can just turn quickly to the workforce point um, thank you to the excellent panel for raising so many important points and and one point that I would like to raise to add to it all is how uh, now that workforce is in the spotlight what can we do to actually encourage the next generation to become and to be involved in um, the health sector um, what I'm hearing from different uh, organizations is that there has been an increase and an uptake in applications 
but there is still a kind of attrition rate about one or two years when once you start working. So these are really important points that we have to try to find, and, and we can only do that together with, uh, with the, the medical associations, with the, um, the health professional associations, with the social partners as well. Um, I see Adam is online. You know, we need to find out what we can do. Uh, we know that it's a, a lot is about working conditions, but is there also a way through training? So I noticed that quite a few colleagues mentioned about the training. So we are actually launching a training package on continuous professional training as part of the EU for Health program. And we hope that this package would also provide the different um, uh, health um, professional organizations all around Europe with an opportunity to have some funding to, to really focus on different areas where they feel they can make a difference with um, continuous professional development. I also take up the point from George on, on this whole idea about skills. And I think that's a fascinating idea, and that's something where we have to um, we have to tackle together. Um, we need to see, as as Elizabeth said, we need to find skills uh, that will absolutely facilitate the work of the nurses and doctors and other health professionals, um, not become a burden, uh, not add to their existing uh, work. And in that regard as well, um, what I think is 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 really important. Um, is, is this whole area around mental health. Um, we have a report by our expert panel. It's an independent panel of experts and we ask them specifically to look at how to address the mental health needs of the health workforce and frontline workers. And here again, it was, it was about taking a bigger, more holistic look where their recommendations were very much on, along the lines of Paul, who said you need to look at well-being, but you also need to integrate uh, mental health in to the organizations. It shouldn't just be it shouldn't just be an add-on when things don't work out. It should be part of everyday work. And there, I would say that that's also something now uh, with Caroline's point about the increase in mental health in, in young people. I think it's time to really, um, you know, the, the WHO says that health is physical and mental well-being. Well, I think it's time now to really look at that. And, and we are in a, in a period of, of great change. Um, and maybe this is the time that we can actually look at how we are going to address these great changes. As Emma said, of course, there's the elephant in the room uh, regarding the competence of what we can do at EU level. But we now have many more um, fun funding opportunities. So uh, we can we can fund um, health in many more ways with the new recovery and resilience facility, as was mentioned, uh, this gives a, an opportunity for member states to really be able to put money with their re health reforms. And so far, um, we have kind of a, an approximate is about 37 billion euros is being spent on, on health measures as part of the uh, recovery and resilience facility. And that's only covering the 22 national plans that we have, um, that we've adopted at the moment. Moment. We also, of course, have the new EU for Health program, which is also uh, a, a, a huge uh, amount compared to what we had before for the health program. But I also want to say that there's also lots of other uh, pots of money, if you like, within the within the Commission. Uh, there's the Erasmus Plus. There's also the Cohesion Policy funds, which are at the moment um, being negotiated for the next um, financial framework. So, in that sense, I think that I want to be positive to say that we do have actually a lot of scope, but here is where we need member states to work together. We do work very closely with member states, but we also need civil society and all of the other um, professional um, associations and the private sector. And I'm very glad uh, to hear uh, what uh, what Digital Europe, what Ray Pinto said, because it's absolutely true. From a, I'm a public health person, so for me, uh, it has been a great relief to actually see public health being put in the spotlight. Uh, um, during this pandemic. For me, that's what the spotlight has given. It's given people an understanding of what public health is, that it's about epidemiology, it's about surveillance, but it's also about uh, working at community level and, uh, and, and identifying how um, population health works. But absolutely, as, as uh, Ray Pinto said, we also have a major fragmentation of, of, of uh, digital health um, across the EU. And I also uh, hope that the European health data space will go some way to alleviating this and to facilitating the acceleration of digital health solutions across Europe. 
I'll, I'll stop here. I don't know if you have any other questions. I need, I need to unmute, yeah. <clears throat> I'm just uh, just taking a look maybe at the Q&As if there's anything particular, but I didn't really see any particular questions to you. So I try uh, at this point to wrap up. Uh, Maya, I think in um, late September last year, we had a cup of coffee in uh, Rue Froissart, and we're discussing the potential of doing an event like this, and now we've done it. And I think uh, it has been really, really great. And I'm grateful to you and to your colleagues, but also for the other partners, the OECD and the observatory uh, on, uh, that you mobilized uh, for, for this event. So thank you very much for making this uh, dream a reality. Um, I also wanted to, to stress what you're saying, that we should not stop thinking about the uh, the health resilience and uh, strengthening the health system in the future, because COVID might be on its last phase, I really hope so, uh, but there will be for a long time, uh, there will be long COVID issues, there will be a lot of delayed treatments actually, that the health system needs to deal with. We know that we have an overburdened workforce, you know, that needs to get time off and so on and so forth. We know that demographics is hitting hard now, you know, the the, the the difference between the aging and and the, and the new taxpayers coming in, we also know that the lifestyle, as uh, Caroline was saying, uh, is affecting a, a lot of the things. There might be threats coming from uh, from uh, climate change, etc. So, I mean, this will not be an, a, a, anything that will stop soon. We need to talk about how we can reset more resources. Uh, to focus more on, uh, I think, doing more health care than just sick care. We need to take care of people, and I think they deserve it for the, all the taxes they pay in, in Europe. So we'd like to create a uniform place, like Ray was saying, the Europe that we want, where everybody has, a, has an equal access to a well-functioning health system. But I think that um, the debate today has covered a number of areas. You know, I think it's been very rich, but obviously I want to say to people, don't think that this is all of it. Go for it yourself, download the material. And also, I don't know if you can see this big report here, which is called Health at a Glance, which is uh, a part of the whole process. This was from 2020, we'll have a new one for 2022. It's a rich, rich, rich catalog of data that gives a lot of inspiration. Compare that, of course, to the to the uh, companion reports and the country reports that are easily read. I think my the country reports are like twenty five pages or something like that. It's a, it's a quick read. There's a lot of good illustration in it as well. So uh, it's a useful instrument, and we covered uh, rich parts of it today. Not everything. So again, download, read, think. Uh, act. I think that's the way you should deal with it. So thank you very much uh, to uh, to all our speakers here. Thank you very much for the three organizations, the Commission, the OECD, and the, and the Observatory for participating here and, uh, and helping us by also sending the fantastic speakers. Thank you very much to all the, the panelists here, Elizabeth Adams, Ray Pinto, Anna O'Don, Sarah Das, George Valiotis and Paul Bonke, and thank you very much to Emma as well for helping me moderate so I didn't get too tired during the day here. It's been great, a uh, great afternoon. Thank you very much indeed and hope to see you again soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.